So a very warm, warm welcome to all of you. Um, this panel is part of our series this term of Sussex Development Lectures, which is the big platform series on campus that's co-organised by IDS, the School of Global Studies, the Centre for International Education and the Science Policy Research Unit. And it was actually supposed to be the kickoff for this series, where this term we're thinking about the humanitarian development nexus. And this was supposed to be the first event. We were going to hold it on the 8th of March, and that was why, that's International Women's Day, and that was why we had managed to, and we're very pleased to assemble this illustrious all-women panel. Um, as in the event, we had to postpone it because of the industrial action over pensions. Um, I'm really thrilled that um, two of our speakers, anyway, have been able to remake this date, so we've re rescheduled it. So I'm going to start by making just a few introductory remarks about the series as a whole and why we've got this topic. Um, I'm then going to turn to Harriet Lamb, who is the Chief Executive of International Alert, a peace-building organisation. Um, I'm then going to turn to Tamsin Barton, who is CEO of Bond, the platform organisation that brings all UK-based NGOs together. And then I'm going to come back um, as the third speaker for a small slot to talk about some of the work IDS has been doing with partners um, around a particular humanitarian crisis. But why are we talking about this, this topic? I mean, our question this evening is how can humanitarian aid workers and development actors work better together to achieve the SDGs in a context, we're saying, of increasingly protracted crises of various kinds? And I think the, the reason for that question comes from the recognition that humanitarian work is very often a bubble. Um, humanitarian workers operate in a context that's often distinct from or often seems to be in a bit of a dichotomy with long-term development. And it sometimes seems to be a, a, a binary of issues. Crisis response is the focus of humanitarian work versus development tackling long-term questions of poverty, inequality, sustainability, governance. It's sometimes also a, a dichotomy of, of funding. Humanitarian aid flows in one direction, but very different from development funding streams. And it sometimes seems to be a dichotomy of actors. So we have agencies and NGOs that specialize in the humanitarian and special government units set up to do it, um, distinct from those involved with long-term development. Um, but the notion that this kind of division is a problem and is something that needs to be overcome, which is really our focus today, is not a new one. It goes back a really, really long way, almost to the origins of development and humanitarian work. And certainly it goes back as far as IDS has been engaging on these issues. So um, back in the early 1990s, Simon Maxwell, who is sitting here in this room, edited an IDS bulletin called Linking Relief and Development um, and centered on the, the benefits to be had from closer links between humanitarian action and development action and analyzed some of the barriers that were preventing the two working closely together. Um, today, we launched earlier this, well, late last year, a humanitarian learning center, which is supported by DFID Save the Children under its Humanitarian Learning Academy. And the premise that we've started out with in the HLC is the need to bridge this, this dichotomy and get the humanitarian development sectors working well together. So I think one question we might want to ask is, why has it proved so difficult if people were saying this in the early 90s and we're still here? Well, we're still here and we're in a context where actually both humanitarian work and development work are more important than ever and actually the, the gaps are more significant than ever. And I just want to introduce this evening by laying out three reasons, three sort of contextual reasons um, why actually bridging that gap is more important than ever. The first is that humanitarianism and humanitarian work is an increasingly important part of the global aid landscape, but it's also increasingly stretched, and that's the problem. So we're seeing growing and urgent humanitarian needs around the world. They're related to conflict, to natural disasters, to epidemics and more. We're seeing growing global attention. So 2016 saw the first ever World Humanitarian Summit, which was held in Istanbul. Had more than 5,000 participants from government, from business, from civil society, 
trying to kind of reinvigorate commitments, a new global compact to put humanitarian work center stage. We're seeing humanitarian work using a growing proportion of aid. So just in the UK, official development assistance last year in the figures that have just been published, more than 10% was for humanitarian assistance. And that spend on, just from the UK aid on humanitarian assistance, had increased by 123 million since 2016. That was mostly reflecting the big responses to famine and drought in East Africa and other crises like the conflict in Yemen. We've also seen a tenfold increase in global humanitarian appeals to donors and to the public since they were launched in 1992, reaching a record 16.9 billion in 2016. Yet, despite this kind of big push, humanitarian work is more important, the system is increasingly overstretched. And of those global appeals in 2016, actually only 57% were funded because the growth in humanitarian funding simply hasn't kept up with the need. So that kind of overstretching is maybe one reason why we might need to think about some different approaches. The second kind of contextual backdrop is what one might call the changing character of crises. They're more protracted, they're more complex. And I know Tamsin's also going to talk about this, so I won't say very much about it, but what we are seeing is that the kinds of violent conflict people are involved in increasingly aren't one-offs. They're not short wars that are over in a year. They're lasting three years or more. And that means that more and more people over longer periods are caught up in them. One might see something like a natural disaster, a drought, an earthquake, or indeed an outbreak, an epidemic, a disease outbreak, as being more like a short-term shock. But increasingly, we see these two being part of complex emergencies where underlying protracted conflicts and fragility um, combine to worsen the effects of kind of one-off epidemics, um, droughts and so on, and make recovery more difficult. So we get these very interlocking complex emergency situations. And we're also learning that what happens in a crisis and whether a short-term shock actually becomes a humanitarian disaster and how effectively it can dealt with, be dealt with depends not primarily on what happens in that moment of crisis itself, but very much on what happens before and what happens afterwards. And that's what I'm going to be picking up on when, when I speak this afternoon. So we're really looking at much less of a humanitarian development dichotomy and more of a continuum. And the third kind of contextual reason why I think we need a, a new approach um, is actually set by the Sustainable Development Goals, these global goals which all countries are committed to meeting with their 169 targets by 2030. And there are multiple interactions between the kinds of issues that, hum that crop up in humanitarian crises and the SDGs. So crisis issues are relevant to almost all of them, whether we're talking about famines in relation to goal two on food, epidemics in relation to the health goal, natural disasters and the ways they relate to goals on climate change, on life on land, life in water, or the goal 17 on peace building and conflict. We're seeing many ways in which humanitarian crises and failures to deal with them compromise other goals. So for instance, countries affected by fragility and conflict um, have far worse health, nutrition, education outcomes, really compromising the ability to achieve those goals. And we're also seeing, I think, the, the SDG agenda placing some new imperatives on how humanitarian work is done, whether we're talking about the gender goal and part of our focus this afternoon. How can we ensure that humanitarian work contributes to and doesn't undermine goal five around gender equality, for instance? And how can we ensure that humanitarian work contributes to and doesn't undermine that really important cross-cutting principle in the SDGs around leave no one behind. So in short, I think the SDGs present a range of new challenges to humanitarian work to minimize trade-offs with long-term sustainable development and to maximize the synergies. So there's some acknowledgement for the need for new approaches, but I think we might want to suggest that there's not enough and while we've got some new global frameworks that are saying we need new approaches, it's there in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, it's there in the UK's new humanitarian reform policy, actually a lot of the challenges happen much more on the ground 
in the real places where crises are unfolding and where development and humanitarian workers are operating and need to operate. And I think we've got some speakers this afternoon who can help, help us understand the challenges and the opportunities, not just at that level of global frameworks and commitments, but very much on the ground too. So um, I'm going to turn in a second, first of all, to Harriet, who I think can give us a perspective from a humanitarian organization that actually doesn't do humanitarian action, but often works with, um, is a peace building organization, but often works with organizations who are doing crisis response. Harriet, um, this is International Alert, where Harriet's been the CEO since 2015 and leads its work currently across 20 countries. Um, to add a little bit more about Harriet and why I'm so pleased she's here, is she's actually an IDS alumnus. She did an MPhil here. Um, I won't ask how many years ago. You can, before you, you had this lovely room. That. Before we <laughs> had this lovely room. Um, and then along the way in between her MPhil and her really important role with International Alert, one of the key things she did and became very well known for was as CEO of Fair Trade International. Um, which she did for around 15 years and was executive director of the Fair Trade Foundation and an absolute stellar campaigner, advocate and leader in the whole area of equity in, in trade and markets. Um, and then, so I think she's really well positioned to help us think about how <laughs> peace building fits into all of this. And then I'll turn straight away to Tamsin, um, who as CEO of Bond really has oversight of the NGOs who are both doing humanitarian work and doing development work and often struggling with the interfaces between them. But Tamsin also comes to that role, which she's been doing for a couple of years now, from a really long and varied career in academia and international development, which has encompassed long spells in DFID, um, working on sanitation and other issues, but also in a number of policy roles and with the European Investment Bank. So she's someone who actually has the long-term development experience as well as the experience with NGOs at the front line of crises. So um, without further ado, let me turn now to Harriet and to explore your take on, on this nexus, if it is a nexus. Thank you very much. Uh, and it is indeed lovely to be here. Um, do any of you uh, listen to Radio 4? Any of you listen to BBC Radio 4? Oh, no. Okay, I have to confess to being a complete addict myself. And um, I was listening to a programme the other day all about how you get established patterns of behaviour. And they're very hard to change. And the example was a, a daughter's leaving the room and her mother shouts after her, Darling, darling, have you had something to eat? You, you know how hungry you'll get. Would you like me to make you a sandwich? And darling, have you seen? It's really cold out there. Have you got enough warm clothes? And the daughter return, turns back and says, Mom, I'm 60. <laughs> I think I can think about these things myself. Uh, and I uh, clearly have a similarly infantile relationship with the IDS, mm -hmm. where I was, as Simon and Robin can attest, an extremely annoying MPhil student many years ago. Uh, and very argumentative, and the minute I saw today's exam question, I wanted to argue with it. Uh, and I would argue that the question is not just about the links between development and humanitarian, that we also absolutely have to have a third pillar, which is about building peace and tackling violent conflict. And you have to have those three pillars of any intervention if we're going to meet the sustainable development goals, if we're going to come near to meeting the sustainable development goals, and if we're going to have sustainable development and peace. And um, as Melissa has said, global humanitarian appeals have increased recently at an absolutely impossible 600% over the past 10 years, which is, of course, why increasingly they're not being properly funded. And critically, 86% of humanitarian aid is going to crises caused by conflict, not by natural disasters. So the nature of the humanitarian intervention has completely changed. And so too has the challenges for development. Conflict is absolutely back on the rise. 
There was a time after the end of the Cold War when the zone of peace did expand, and it showed actually what was possible, that you could reduce violent conflict. That has all gone screaming into reverse, and the events of the past week or so only point to an even more worrying future. That conflicts are on the rise again. We've got the largest humanitarian crisis of our lifetimes, with more people on the move than since the Second World War. We've got more people being killed in battle than for 25 years. And we've also got a fundamental shift in the nature of conflict, in that, in particular, civilians, including women and children, are much more affected than they ever used to be. So this September will be marking 100 years, or this November will be marking 100 years since the end of World War I, ironically called the war to end all wars. And in that war, 5% of the casualties were civilians. That, that statistic is just about completely reversed now that overwhelmingly the majority of casualties of war now are civilians, with women and children hit in particular. And as Melissa said, that means also that conflicts are going on for longer, they're much more protracted, and humanitarian crises are going on for much longer. It's, it's not a question of helping people recover from a natural disaster and go back to their homes. People are now, on average, a refugee for 17 years. And so the nature of the intertwining between the humanitarian, the peace building, and the development responses has completely transformed. And that means that all of us in those three pillars have to alter the way that we work without undermining our mandates. And I think that's one of the critical things for the humanitarian world is that they're very, very protective of their mandate to save lives absolutely impartially. And their determination to protect that mandate has sometimes what's meant that until recently they were quite uh, resistant, if you like, to working more closely with people proactively seeking to build development or peace, whereas that has begun to shift. And just to take one example, uh, Lebanon. Is there anyone here from Lebanon? Anybody here? Yes. <laughs> well, Lebanon is, is a tiny country. I think you'll agree. <laughs> I think it's about a third the size of Belgium, and itself barely recovering from its own civil war, Lebanon is currently hosting well, well over a million Syrian refugees. That's about a quarter of Lebanon's population are now refugees. So in Britain, that will be like Britain in a very short space of time, hosting 19 million refugees. As it happens, in Britain, we committed to take 20,000 mm. Syrian refugees by 2020. Mm. So you can imagine the tension that hosting a quarter of your population as refugees creates. And I've spoken to young Syrian boys, for example, who explain how difficult it is living there, how people shout at them in the street and say, go home, ISIS, and you smell, and I don't want you in my class or in my football team. And the tension, you can imagine, it's almost crackling in places like Bekar Valley. I hope you'll agree with me. And in that situation, the humanitarian response, in one way, has been fantastic. That In a very short space of time, refugees have overwhelmingly been given places to live. And people have responded and have saved lives. But initially, it was done in a way that was just go in, provide the tents, provide the livelihood, save lives, without thinking about the relations with the Lebanese host community and the long term. And in fact, of course, many people are there still seven years later. So, for example, in the health clinics, the health, to take one everyday example, the health clinics were completely overwhelmed. They had uh, the normal Lebanese population, and Lebanon's not a wealthy country, and now you suddenly had your clinic absolutely full with Syrian refugees, many of whom you then saw to your shock were getting their care either free or actually four times cheaper than you, as a poor Lebanese person, were having to do. You were having to pay for your medicines, and sometimes the refugees were getting them for free. You can imagine the kind of tension 
that that creates within, just within the health centre. The staff were absolutely stretched to breaking point, trying to prevent fights coming out uh, in the health centres. And they would try all tactics. Sometimes they would separate people. They'd have Lebanese here, some like Syrians there. Sometimes they would fast-track the Lebanese to try to stop them getting angry. But, of course, that made the Syrians angry, who'd been waiting all day with a sick child. And so, actually, what it took was stepping outside of that and giving the health workers a chance to sit down also with the government, with the humanitarian agencies, and think about the simple things that they could do to help prevent that tension rising in the health centres, about how they could have an orderly way that when you arrive you get given a number and you go by number, that they could persuade some of the humanitarians to also subsidise the health care for poor Lebanese. So that gradually, one of the flashpoints for tension that could have led to more conflict was actually managed in a way that people could go on living together. Another example was the same in education. In the rush to get the kids into school, a two-shift system was introduced, which actually meant the Lebanese and the Syrian children were never together. The consequence was, again, the tensions between the two communities rose and that where people could do joined up healthcare, where they could do that, that actually dramatically reduced the tension between the communities, enabled the humanitarian support to the uh, Syrian refugees to be given, and for them to begin to integrate better with the Lebanese community. And it's those kind of very practical nuts and bolts work on the ground that needs to be done. The rhetoric was there. It was there at the World uh, Humanitarian Conference, as you mentioned, where everybody signed up, actually, to um, principles about making sure that the way humanitarian assistance is given is done in a way that helps build peace and lay the foundations for sustainable development. And so, in general, overall, I would say, from the UN to the World Bank, to the big humanitarians, the policies are not so bad. It is the practice that, in general, is not so good. And that's really the struggle that we've got to think about, is how can we really have a radical rethink about the global structures for peace development and humanitarian aid, because currently they're simply not working. And we can perhaps explore some more examples about the best way uh, in the discussion after. Harriet, thank you so much. And I think that's one of the most powerful examples one could have, actually, and really, really brings out the, the struggles on the ground. So turning to Tamsin, um, what would you have to say about this exam question? You might also want to take apart the exam question. That's perfectly allowed. Or you can address it however you choose. Thanks, thanks very much, Lisa. Well, I don't have the honour, as uh, Harriet does, of being an alumna, uh, but I do have the honour as, as Bond of hosting IDS as one of our associate members, also the honour of uh, International Alert being one of our members. So, so Bond, as Lisa mentioned, has, uh, we're the umbrella organisation actually for about 450 uh, civil society organisations, and we connect and support them to help eradicate global poverty, inequality and injustice. And the, the main way in which we work, which connects with today, is that we convene our members in working groups to share learning and to coordinate advocacy. So one of the largest bond working groups, there are about 40 of them, is, is the humanitarian one. But we also have groups focusing on conflict prevention uh, and on disaster risk reduction. So I do have oversight, but I hasten to say in this very distinguished company that I am so far from having the kind of expertise of my fellow panellists or indeed many of you in the room. Uh, my experience and expertise is, is limited rather to a, a spell in uh, ITDG Now Practical Action where one of the, the work streams was on disaster risk reduction, so that's been bred into me a bit, uh, and a, a very brief spell in DFID's Conflict Humanitarian and Security Department where I, I, pen, I held the pen for a paper on conflict prevention when the numbers were going much more in the right direction uh, for Hillary Benn. Uh, but things have changed a great deal since then, although not, not, and certainly not all for the better. So what's the problem that we're talking about today? Uh, if I can draw on Sophie, I think it is. 
to project a picture. Thank you, that's wonderful. Uh, then this is the person who, who knows what the problem is. So this is a Somali woman who is a displaced person. And, and what she says, I don't suppose you can see the, the, the print there. She says, we always see organisations, they come to visit us, but the community needs to develop. And I, I think in, in, in a good way, from the right perspective, that sums up the problem that we have today. Because if you look at it from the point of view of a displaced person, that's what's needed, and indeed for their host communities. What you can't see, unfortunately, down there on the left, with the, which is what makes it such a deeply wonderful and slightly ironic picture, that is Mark Lowcock, who I gather is going to come and talk to you soon, who is the head of the UN's office uh, for Humanitarian Operations, OCHA. Uh, and so, although he wasn't when, he, when this picture was taken, but never mind, it works very well symbolically. So you have the very sort of top of the pyramid and the reality on the, the front line. And as I talk, keep in mind the perspective uh, of this woman. Unfortunately, I couldn't find out her name. I apologise for that, but it took me a while to find someone who would provide this perspective. It actually comes from an event preceding the World Humanitarian Summit, which you mentioned earlier. And she dialed in to, to speak to the, the, the policymakers before the summit. So let me move on from there and just briefly take you back to what uh, Melissa was talking about earlier, the context, more from an evidence point of view, I suppose. As, as she said, it is an incredibly old chestnut. When I, I saw this uh, title, I just thought, gosh, things haven't moved on enormously since I was doing my development <laughs> studies degree in 1991. Uh, whenever you get to an old chestnut, the thing to do is to turn to someone who's been looking at these things for a long time. So I, of course, turned to Simon uh, Maxwell, who was mentioned earlier, and he helpfully provided me with the, all the, with the work on linking relief and development. And I think that, if, as I understood from that... Really, this thinking about the need to bridge the divide came particularly from the food crises of the 70s in Africa. But at that time, you're looking at far smaller numbers of, of refugees. But it, it forced people to think, hang on a minute, this is a much more long-term issue. And it's, I would say the issue comes from both directions. Uh, so as, as it was put by Simon at that time, emergencies are very costly in terms of human life and resources. So they set development back, and they take a long time for rehabilitation. But the, the where it causes a problem is they tend to spawn these parallel bureaucratic structures, which can, in the worst case, actually undermine the local organisations which can work for development. So they can duplicate them or cut across them or even undermine them. But, as also mentioned, it's very important to look at it from the development side uh, and note that on, on that side, often there's great insensitivity to the risk of droughts, shocks of various kinds. That was pointed out then, and it's all the more obvious now because there are more, more, there's more need to be resilient. So, again, as, as mentioned earlier, there are reasons why this has come back because it's more urgent now, if you like, in, in some ways, because of the scale. So just to give you some stats on, 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 about, uh, on the nature of this. So more than 80% of refugee crises now last for more than 10 years Two in five lasts for more than 20 years. That's extraordinary. The, the number of displaced people has risen to over 65 million. I think the earliest figure quoted in that piece from Simon referred to a million. I mean, it's just incredible. I think that's going back to the 70s. So in this context, obviously, as, uh, as was said, then people are receiving humanitarian aid for an almost, an almost permanent basis, like Palestinian mm -hmm. refugees. So the other, the other reason that was briefly mentioned earlier is about how overstretched the humanitarian system has become. Even though appeals have gone up ten times uh, since 1992 to a record almost 17 billion in 2016, they're significantly underfunded. So it was 57% funded in 2016. And, and, and in, in another interesting point in relation to this is that the countries which are most exposed to crises receive the least, the lowest levels of official development assistance per capita. So, for example, Somalia, Central African Republic, Haiti, Zimbabwe, Chad, and even Nigeria, according to the OECD. So, if I put that very simply, uh, the most vulnerable people in the most vulnerable countries, and I 
guess our, our picture here is one of them, are not being given the priority that they deserve for development. And why is this happening? We, you heard a little bit about this already as well. If I had to put it in one word, why is, why, what are the barriers to bridging this divide? That one word would be culture. Alyssa referred to a bubble. I think it's very, very striking. And I'm going to focus on the humanitarian culture and caricature it a little bit. Because, as you said, there is an attempt to address this. But actually, there's a huge amount of resistance, and it's not happening as fast as it should be. So if I caricature a bit, the humanitarian culture, it's top-down, it's northern-led, it's very tactical, it's very short-term. And as one of my colleagues who worked as a humanitarian for many, many years said, it's incredibly adrenaline-driven. And that gives you a sense of how it's a very different culture from long-term development. And that cultural divide means very different kinds of people who operate in different ways and probably continue to do so uh, over a long period. And everywhere you look, that means that an organisational division will emerge. So whether it's the UN, the uh, UN uh, OCHA was actually set up to bridge this divide, but it, it, it stayed firmly on one side of it. In the EU, you have complete separation, completely different rules for ECHO from the rest. In most bilaterals, it's a separate organisation. And NGOs, you know, you said or our members have both, but actually even within, for example, Oxfam, there's a huge cultural divide between the humanitarian support personnel yep. and the others, even between the humanitarian policy and the humanitarian uh, delivery people, there, there is a cultural divide. And that's partly this sense that they've got to protect, they can't have anything distracting them from their mission of saving lives. It just, it's just a small anecdote on this. The, the humanitarian group in Bondu are absolutely brilliant, but I just thought it typified the whole thing. I needed a, a briefing to give to ministers on why there were, there were risks for poor people uh, in, in relation to Brexit and development funding. And the humanitarian people produced a fantastic brief, but they absolutely refused to combine it with the development brief, which made it a little bit odd to put in you know, to the ministers. Same, same sort of culture. <coughs> but now I'm going to get to one particular feature of the culture, uh, which I thought was particularly appropriate for International Women's Day, which is gender, as mentioned earlier. Famously, it's a case of minding the gap uh, between male and female. And I, th I thought, I've got to actually find out, like with the other issues, I've got to find out what the facts and the evidence are about gender, because there's been quite a bit written recently about this question, that the humanitarian culture is male. Uh, and so I, I tried to get data, and it was actually very, very difficult. So starting with the field staff, uh, on a, the, uh, all I could find was there's a database of humanitarian workers who were victims of attacks where there was some gender disaggregation for 1,473 victims uh, over 1997 to 2014. And, and basically 14% of those people were female. I think that tells you something uh, about the likely proportion of female field workers. But it probably tells you something that nobody bothered to check, uh, how many are men and how many are women. So that's at the front line. And then there's the leadership. There's a, an amazing paper on the culture, which I commend to you by, uh, uh, is it Margie Buchanan-Smith yeah. and, uh, and, and Kim Scriven? Very good. I'm glad I'm referring to IDS often enough. <laughs> uh, I did mention ODI once or twice, but you can scrub that from the record. Um, so, so, yeah, great, great, great paper. And uh, what, what they say is it was difficult to find many examples of effective operational humanitarian leadership provided by women when drawing up our potential case studies. Okay. That's pretty scary, okay. I think. And then finally, the last bit of evidence I could find was on, on visibility. So new research from the humanitarian aid group finds that only 23% of experts and officials quoted in news stories about humanitarian issues with female. And that, again, shows you how, how invisible they are. So it's a man's world. And frankly, everybody I asked said, it's a macho culture. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that's what they say. So lives are saved, but are the priorities right? So one of the interviewees in, that, in relation to the Buchanan, Smith and Scriven paper was Susan Nicolai, who'd worked for 12 years in emergency response. And she came up with the idea that then, this was 2011, Maybe some of the longer-term issues like education and protection, where female 
female leadership was more common, had been neglected. So that, that's a point to ponder. But of course, the thing that strikes us most now in 2018 is that this male world has a, a huge influence when it comes to this issue of safeguarding, which has come up. And I absolutely refuse to call this thing that has come up the Oxfam scandal. And I hope none of you will, because it's not about Oxfam. It's, it's about the whole sphere. So last right. point. Yep. Uh, so my solution for you as to how we're going to bridge the divide and change the culture is we've got to add the yin to the yang. Uh, basically, it's, it's about the lack of gender balance, which relates to that very limited pool of people who are prepared to live the humanitarian lifestyle. Uh, and the best way that we would get a better balance is we'd actually have that integration. We'd have the localization agenda. We'd have the cooperation. Because it would be happening at that local community level. And this current crisis that we have relating to safeguarding is an opportunity. It's the only reason we might be able to change these entrenched patterns, because it's allowing us all to re-examine how we do things, that the bond members, uh, both on the humanitarian and development side, and build back better. So I think that she would see this as a very good idea. And maybe you at IDS can help. <laughs> Fantastic, Tamsin. That's, that's great. And actually leads rather well into the final little remark and stories that I wanted to add to this. So um, what I want to do is just share a quick story based on one particular crisis. And this was the West African Ebola outbreak in 2014-15 where IDS researchers and partners in country became quite involved. And what we did in the context of that work, it was a, a, an initiative that we actually called Ebola Lessons for Development. And we um, produced a series of practice papers, um, which went along with a platform that we ran about trying to bring social science and development knowledge into the hands of response agencies, including a lot of humanitarian agencies. And what that work really did was to draw out why it was that actually taking into account the longer-term development context and the social and cultural context in which this particular outbreak was unfolding and rapidly became a crisis that certainly initially the humanitarian community could not deal with and was beginning to run out of control and then how it turned around required knowledge and engagement from communities very much and the ability to bring that knowledge into the response. And in just putting these remarks together, I was also, I mean, what, what I'm just going to say is something briefly about before and during and after a crisis and why this kind of social and community knowledge is important. But it very much, I found, struck chords with another paper that's just come out of a piece of work by IDS and this, I mentioned earlier, this humanitarian learning center that we run. Um, and a briefing that has just been produced by Stephen Devereaux and Lewis Sider, who runs the platform, and Tina Nellis, who's a staff member here, um, around lessons learned from famine, actually makes many of the same points. And this is a paper that is well worth looking at, and it basically comes up with 12 reasons why, in the context of current famines and impending famines, we need to learn lessons which go right back to the 1980s and the, and the, the, the famines in Ethiopia and, and South Sudan then and the kinds of things that were leading into the linking relief and development work that, that Simon and others were talking about are so relevant today. So that's another piece worth looking at. But the Ebola outbreak, um, we found, could not be understood or responded to in the short term. So in the short term, this was a virus which um, caused an outbreak of a very, very nasty hemorrhagic fever. Um, but the reasons why that outbreak became an epidemic which affected three countries in the tri-border region of West Africa and then a pandemic which was declared an international health emergency by the WHO very belatedly and then span out and, and threatened the world, um, reflected not a virus and particular people, but actually deep-seated vulnerabilities and what we came to call the structural violence in this region caused by decades of maldevelopment, okay, to put it quite bluntly. And this included um, patterns of 
neoliberal structural adjustment through the 80s and 90s and economic reforms, which had hollowed out the state, left public services, including health services, really weak, understaffed and resource poor, so that when one began to get this outbreak happening, people couldn't deal with it. The conditions in hospitals and health centers allowed for and exacerbated the spread of disease. And almost more significantly, people didn't visit health services when they got sick because health services had always been so weak and understaffed that they weren't worth it. And there was actually a culture of avoidance of the formal health service. So when suddenly people were asked to visit it in the context of Ebola, they didn't. Those very same neoliberal economic reform-driven development styles had also encouraged across the region a lot of foreign direct investment in commercial agriculture and in mining which had caused in many cases land grabs and dispossession of local people from resource rights and had created both the undermining of local livelihoods which drove a flood of urbanization and people heading to the cities creating conditions of unemployment and overcrowding in urban centers where the virus just ran riot in an urban context. And also conditions of mistrust, very deep-seated mistrust between communities and outsiders, where they were very used to outsiders not just coming along and visiting, but often genuinely coming along and taking people's land, taking people's resources, setting up big mining schemes which promised employment and didn't deliver it. So when outside agencies came along and said, right, we've come to deal with this Ebola outbreak, it was actually quite logical for anxieties to run riot and people to say, well, what do they really want to do? Is this actually, these sanitation efforts, are they actually about spreading a virus and causing a genocide, which will then free up this land so that the mining companies can take it? And these things were often dismissed in the, the early stages of the outbreak by humanitarian agencies as somehow misguided rumours that needed to be overcome in communities by kind of education. But actually, they reflected decades of people's real experiences of what it was like to interact with, with foreigners, which just came to light in that context. Um, so we had a situation where an outbreak began and began to spread very, very fast through poorly resourced health services and, and urban settings. And initially, the, the response was very much as has been described. It was a, a siloed, externally led, quite macho, mm. frankly, um, top-down response involving initially a number of NGOs who did incredibly well to get in there quickly, Médecins Sans Frontières, which epitomizes, in my experience, some of these aspects of the culture that Tamsin has been talking about. They tend to be first in and last out, and they do incredible work in saving lives. So they set up um, clinics and field hospitals. But they also found that from the very beginning, villagers sometimes stoned their vehicles. They didn't let them into their communities. And as Ebola treatment centers began to be set up by those NGOs, and then eventually by government and different European governments took different countries to focus on for their response and brought in military personnel to help set up hospitals, people resisted them. And they often didn't bring for come forward to the treatment centers or they actually stole their patients away from them. And that was because of real fear driven by this kind of mistrust and, and a fear that actually what was going on in treatment centers was not curing disease, but potentially stealing body parts or, or, or creating further divisions. Um, there were also gendered aspects to this. So some of that response was quite masculinist in its style, actually. Um, and women had faced particular challenges. Um, there was an incredibly re report. It actually, drew, it actually caused me to burst into tears on a train, rather embarrassingly, as I was reading it, from West Point in Monrovia, where it was found that women with Ebola were too frightened to go to treatment centers because they were worried about what would happen to their children if they left, left them behind in their communities. And so those caring roles with family <coughs> members actually stopped women from getting treatment. And then, of course, it was, it was women who were doing a great deal of the home care, often very unsupported because outside agencies decided that home care for Ebola was a really bad thing. It was too risky, <coughs> wanted everybody in these big units. 
And it was only much later on that, that actually support for home care began to happen. So what eventually began to turn this response around? Well, what, what eventually happened, because one had this resistance, this standoff, it reached a bit of a head when an Ebola sensitization team in September 2014 um, was actually killed by a group of villagers in a, in a, a village in Womi in, in, in Guinea because people feared that this was a, a genocide and this team of doctors had actually come to kill people. And they, the villagers actually killed the... It was actually led by the Women's Secret Society, actually killed the response team. Um, horrendous effect, but actually explained by these logics of mistrust. But things began to turn around, and they turned around principally as community members themselves began to see that this was a real virus and that there was that that people were getting infected and getting infected and sick and they began to put in place their own practices to prevent transmission um, and in particular they took burials which and funerals which were one of the main sources of transmission into their own hands and rather than have external burial teams which had been one of the big sources of resistance happening because burials are a very important part of local social social practice and people really resented outside teams coming to tell them how to bury their bury their dead people began to do their own burials their own home care and began to adapt the ways they did it to minimize transmission risk so stopping some of the physical rituals that have been involved stopping touching people and finding their own ways to do care in a way that in, in a way that involved protection and, and gradually, and I think assisted by some of the work that social scientists did and, and the IDS platform working with colleagues in Sierra Leone and Liberia, I think had a role to play by bringing some of that community learning and the, the social and cultural practices it was embedded in and the importance of community institutions, youth groups, women's and men's initiation societies, um, chieftaincy structures in being really well positioned to manage those affairs a slightly different relationship um, between humanitarian agencies and communities was able to be forged. One based more on respectful dialogue, one based more on balancing disease risk and the social protocols which were important to local life, um, and actually beginning to work with the community learning which was actually turning the epidemic around rather than halting it. Um, and so in the aftermath of, of the Ebola crisis, some of the important lessons that I think are there to be learned, and there's been a spate of lesson learning. I mean, I think one talks about um, crisis as opportunity, and Tamsin mentioned the safeguarding mm. crisis as an opportunity to do things differently. The Ebola crisis has been a moment of immense lesson learning for humanitarian agencies, global health agencies, um, and actually the global health community and how to work differently. And one of the key lessons has been about the importance of building resilience um, and having effective systems, and in this case particularly health systems, but also trusted relations between public authorities and communities so that when you do get a, a, a crisis happening, you can head it off by actually having the resources and the services and the trust relationships to work with. And the other really important piece of lesson learning, which is now coming out in lots of reports, is the importance of community engagement before, during, and critically after responses. Um, so some of the, the, the rebuilding of health systems and of global health governance that is now happening is taking much, much more notice of the need to bring communities on board and to have um, appropriate services that aren't just bringing outsiders along to come and visit people, but are actually involving communities in developing um, resilient services which can actually be prepared for and then head off the next outbreak before it becomes a crisis. So that's just a story which I think illustrates some of these broader points too. <coughs> but let's open it up, but before we go for Q&A from the floor, can I suggest that each of you turn to your neighbour, because we've done a lot of talking, turn to your neighbour and have a quick buzz. What, from what you've heard over the last half hour, has surprised you? What do you make of, of 
this exam question about the need for better working together. What would you like to raise in this discussion? Let's just take literally a couple of minutes to get you all thinking and talking with each other. Good. And with Jill's reasonable. I know we'd all got some figures. <laughs> It's a very good idea to start like this, to yeah. give people... You always do. Yeah, because otherwise it's... Otherwise it might be only Simon who asks the question. <laughs> you can rely on him. <laughs> um, I think... Yeah, no, I think that... Um, I love that Ebola story. Yeah, exactly. No, it's really good. Um, and I think... Because I, I don't think it's only that humanitarians are to blame and development people are lovely. I think development people do lots of mistakes, which if it comes up, we could have a debate on, because I think we that's can, quite interesting. So we can have a, a, a view it differently. It, it, it's not only, but I mean, there's more... Yeah, it's like I did balance it out in the beginning, but yeah. the cultural divide is more evident because of this... Yeah. So, so I mean, I, w I won't... You know, I don't want to talk openly about everything that I know, but to, just today I was in Chase and they were talking about giving up on the lo discussing localization anymore in, in, a, in, a, in a working group. Because basically, it's a minority of NGOs that are pushing it. The majority don't really want to do it. This is two years after the World Humanitarian Summit. Localization um, agenda. Yeah, giving which, up on it. Yeah. Which, which is kind of, you know, this is what, this is what it, how can we give up on it? Actually, it's, still, it's 20 years' work, not two days. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Right, so. Okay. So there is obviously plenty to say plenty to say on this issue so let's let's now share some of what we've been thinking and talking about what we'll do we've got now kind of 35 minutes or so so let's take a round of questions a, a question a comment try and keep them brief so we can get through lots say quickly who you are um, because I suspect in fact I know that we've got people in this room with some really important experiences as in the humanitarian sector, in the development sector, and it's good to, to know where you're coming from. And we'll take kind of three or four, three or four questions or comments and then come back to the panel and then we'll take another round. So I think we've got some mics going round. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So who'd like to begin? Let's start here at the front. Yeah. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for the fabulous talk. Um, I am Marisol, I'm a PhD student, uh, development studies, also looking, uh, looking at local peace building initiatives. Um, and my question for you is, I, I've noticed a lot, um, both uh, Tamsin and Harriet have discussed about this humanitarian bubble, um, and it echoes a lot of what, I don't know, uh, Severino Tasser has written in Peaceland, and very extensively about this culture of humanitarians that are on the ground in various countries doing humanitarian work. And I was wondering if you could speak to just how to, I guess, how to bridge the realities to the ground to these peace building and humanitarian workers who are often there on a rotation basis and stay there for maybe one to two years and then leave again while those on the ground have to stay and, you know, witness the next batch of <laughs> in, um, interventions and, you know, oftentimes not really addressing the realities on the ground. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for that amazing thought-provoking uh, talk. Uh, my name is Tanzila Mujumdad Trishti. I'm a Bangladeshi development practitioner, currently doing my master's in globalization, business and development in IDS. Uh, my question is very specific to one kind of humanitarian crisis which my country is facing right now, the refugee, Rohingya refugee crisis. So uh, even though a lot of NGOs who are very development biased, they want to do development work on field, but because these people, the refugees are on uh, land of some other country and the government not necessarily does not want them to 
stay there for a really long time. So let's say even if I'm an NGO, a development worker, I want to go and build schools, hospitals for them there, I would probably not be able to do that due to barriers. So how do we kind of bridge that gap between the humanitarian work and the development work there? Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm Lila. I'm here studying my Master's in Gender and Development. Um, I was just wondering about the cases of sexual exploitation and what you guys think this reveals about the broader power dynamics within the humanitarian industry and also how do we change these? Hi. Whenever I hear this debate, it always feels like we're just saying it's the humanitarian's fault. You know, they're too male, they're too quick, they don't care enough about knowledge. And if we're going to build a closer partnership between development and humanitarians, it's not going to work if we just keep telling the humanitarians it's all their fault. And I, I wonder if we have to look to ourselves and look to development to wonder, well, how well suited are we to responding to humanitarian crises? What made the Ebola platform so unusual at IDS and so exciting was that we turned it around so quickly. But that is normally how we work. And I remember Duncan Green writing about how, you know, when you have a humanitarian crisis, first the journalists come, then a, then a few days later the humanitarians come, and then a year later the researchers come. So what are we going to have to do about ourselves? Yeah, uh, right point. Okay, well, come to Simon, because he's been referenced heavily thus far. So good to get you into the debate, Simon. Thanks. I'm Simon. I want to push Harriet on something, but before I do that, you've done three very interesting things which set up a discussion. One, you've talked about very different kinds of emergencies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ebola, famines, wars, refugees from wars, displaced people from wars, and the question is whether the same conclusions apply to each of those. The second is you each produce very different hypotheses about what the problem is. You know, is it culture, um, as per Tamsin? Um, is it about um, uh, humanitarians protecting their space, uh, as per Harriet? Is it about mistrust of civil services, as per Melissa? Those are kind of different explanations, and, and we need somehow to link them together. And then you've also produced very different kinds of solutions about what might be done. So yeah. we could talk about each of those, but I want to pick on one, which is Harriet's really interesting point, which is that humanitarians have historically been very protective of their space. And when I moved from... IDS to ODI, I came across that because ODI has the biggest group of humanitarian workers in the world, probably, and a really brilliant program on humanitarian issues. But, you know, neutrality, impartiality, leave us alone kind of thing was very much the, the, the tenor of the conversation. But then when we come to conflict, Harriet, you say we need a third pillar. And that then requires us, actually, to say to the humanitarians, you can't have that because it doesn't work, at least in some of the kinds of emergencies we're talking about. And I just printed out before I came um, Penny Morden's speech from this morning. Mm. And I just wanted to read three sentences from it, Minister, if you'll allow me to. Um, the first says, uh, the common thread that runs through the world's worst humanitarian crises is not famine or drought, but man's own actions, conflict, crime, corruption, capital flight, and climate change. I think agreed, and you've said that. Um, then, we're going to create new country-level programming targeted at specific communities and locations vulnerable to extremism and organised crime. Mm. That sounds very much like kind of prevent for developing mm. countries and is, is, is potentially slightly scary. And then um, the third one is um, we will preempt the need for humanitarian relief by building in resilience through recovery, reconstruction and through the development and promotion of insurance schemes. And I read that sentence and I think to myself, Yemen? You know, uh, uh, bits of Syria which are being bombed and, and gassed, insurance schemes. So that brings me full circle, really, to the question of we have to be very specific about which emergencies, which hypotheses, but also really let's really dig into these implications for what it means to work in these very difficult places. Great. Well, I think that's uh, let's let's start with that group, which is fairly extensive, and I just just. Go back to each of you, Harriet. Do you want to yeah, pick up any responses? You don't have to listen to them all. Can we have ten minutes each again? Right. Uh, well, I think the common thread that runs through everything is that, despite the difficulty that does pose for humanitarians, uh, we have to go back to the politics of what's going on in every situation and every context. And if you don't have that kind of power analysis of the politics, how can you begin to do good development aid or good 
humanitarian aid. And I do think there is an increasing recognition um, among humanitarians, I think that is what came out of Istanbul, was a recognition that that absolutely critical is that they are aware of the impact of their actions and going from do no harm, you can only do that if you have a political analysis of the power into which you're intervening. And I would completely agree that absolutely uh, development actors have to have exactly the same. And I would agree, I think both schools are flawed and that running through humanitarian and development, you have to have a power analysis, a context analysis, each of which is different, and then your ruthless focus on how are you going to tackle poverty and build peace. So to take one example, Mali, I would say Mali is an example where we have um, the vicious circle of the, the wrong kind of development, favouring elites, marginalising politically and economically some parts of the country, who therefore in the end it, the conflict becomes violent, which then leads to humanitarian crises, to which then the response is military, which then securitises the whole thing, which then pushes people directly into the hands of the armed groups. So I went to Mali recently. Every nation in the world is busy. We've just given helicopters. The French are there, the UN's there, the Germans are there, the US are there. You go to an airport, Mopti, that used to have planes flying direct from Paris to see the wonders of Timbuktu. Now you've got EU aid plane, a falling apart Mali camouflage plane. Uh, you've got the French Balkan plane. You've got the UN white planes. You've got sandbags. Uh, what's it called? Barbed wire. Exactly what I worry is going to happen with the focus on targeting, targeting violent extremism. Because the reason the whole world is worried about Mali and Sahel is because there is violent extremism in mm. that area. And, but the way they're responding is just exacerbating the problem. And I met a man who told me, uh, I got this close to joining the armed group because I was so angry when the security forces killed uh, my friend because he was a Fulani. And the, the state is totally absent. There is no development. There's no development because there's no peace, but there's no peace because there's no development. Mm. So we've really got to get, I think, that kind of power analysis joined up. And I thought that was very disappointing, the Secretary of State's speech, assuming that development will lead to peace. It's got to be really deliberately targeted to do that. And you've got to say, we're doing development in a way that tackles the root causes of the conflict, not the symptom. And in most cases, violent extremism is a symptom. So I would absolutely agree that development needs to change as well. I think that's right. We absolutely shouldn't get into pointing fingers at the humanitarians. I think it's up to the whole architecture needs to change, including the political uh, institutions that are absolutely failing at the moment to cope with the crises that the world faces, whether it's the Security Council or whether it's intervening to support uh, refugees. And I think going back to the root causes of the conflict is also relevant to Myanmar, where actually uh, all the armed groups in Myanmar have been saying all along, the West adores Aung San Suu Kyi, but guys, we're still in a very difficult position here. And it was overlooked until Rakhine State came up. And obviously it puts people in an incredibly difficult position. All the humanitarians are thinking, do we support IDP camps back in Myanmar? What if people mm. are forced back? Yeah. So if, if they're forced back, are we actually just enabling the military to do what it wants, enabling the government of Bangladesh to do what it wants, but the people don't want to go back? Or do they want to go back? I mean, it's really a difficult, it's a terrible situation, I think, for people who up till now have run those camps to know when they're actually supporting a military dictatorship. And on the other hand, they're supporting those people to survive. So at the end, it goes back again and again and again. If you don't address the root drivers, you'll just be there in another 20 years, 30 years. And those refugees have been in camps for decades, some of them. So uh, I think it comes back to that and back to supporting the culture of community groups, back to the very first question, which I think was that the long-term solution is absolutely, as Tamsin <coughs> said, about supporting local community groups. I have with me a very lovely prop. My bag from DRC, Congo, which is a group of 60 women's groups who've come together. It's called Grand Sans La Femme, and they produce this fantastic material. I think it's such a great uh, campaign tool. <laughs> so when you walk around, you see all the women wearing this brilliant material, which was a campaign the women ran to make sure that women participated more in local elections. 
at the end of the day, it's activities like those women that will help move towards progress in a country like DRC, not the white four by fours driving around and all the power imbalances that that brings with it. Brilliant. Um, Tamsin, do you have anything you want to pick yeah. up on there? And also, I might ask you to perhaps pick up on the sexual exploitation question, which was is connected to a lot of the rest of this also. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yes. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll pick up first by agreeing that, indeed, it goes both ways. Uh, you know, everybody needs to change, including on the development side. I briefly alluded to the need in doing development to, to look at resilience. I didn't particularly talk about conflict sensitivity, but I know Harriet would want me to, to do that. Um, in, in the context of bond members, then, obviously, some organisations are uh, you know, purely one or the other. It's easiest to see how it would work in organisations which are multi-mandate, uh, the, the Oxfam's of this world or the, or the plans, for example, where it ought to be possible at least the, the, the local offices would be the starting point within the organisation rather than the, the people who, who fly in. And I know that this is the subject of endless debate and complication as to when you need the specialists to come in and how much can be done. So to caricature, one of my informants said, well, you know, some of our country offices say, when it's a, it's a sort of mega crisis involving millions, oh, yeah, me and my PA can cope fine without you. Um, and at the other extreme, clearly, it's quite inappropriate to fly in lots of people when the real expertise is there. So there, there is a complex debate. But I think the key message is the one that you gave us, which is that we always need to look to ourselves, whichever community we see ourselves as, as coming from. That's where mm -hmm. cultural change has to come from, is starting from looking to ourselves. And that links me nicely to the sexual exploitation and abuse mm -hmm. question. So that's what I was referring to. Uh, with the safeguarding scandal w w was that. And today I was uh, the, in a working group which has been set up in the wake of that and following bond members, civil society organisations getting together ourselves with a determination to build back better uh, following the revelations that, that we have seen. And we have started by contracting by, if you like, we all have agreed that we start with ourselves. So Whatever we commit to do, this is the organisational culture group, we have to know we can do it in our own organisations and for our partners. Uh, so we hope that will start us off in the right direction. And it's actually not easy because, I mean, obviously gender inequality is very entrenched. It's part of power dynamics north and south. So that's always going to be very challenging to do. But there are all sorts of perverse incentives in this world and transparency about the what is going on, reporting incidents of this nature is incredibly sensitive in an environment as hostile as we have to aid and development at the moment. Uh, and it, it, it's something which we're concerned we could forfeit the trust of the public if uh, irresponsible media take the, the, the information that we give them. And indeed, one could argue that Oxfam itself took a risk by being transparent in the first place and saying that, that it had dismissed people. And at that time, maybe it wasn't so obvious that you had to say what exactly the gross misconduct was. Anyway, there's a whole debate there, uh, but we are determined uh, to build back better and, where appropriate, to bring in uh, government on that because, in some cases, there are legal barriers to, to doing what we want to do and working internationally. Um, so th just the last couple of points... The Penny Mordaunt speech, which I was at this morning and, and was so swiftly putting out our, our press lines, you know, almost the minute we, we walked out, I think the important thing to realise about what she was trying to do there was she was not speaking probably to us and you, know, you in this room, uh, the, the, those who believe in aid. She wasn't speaking to the people who will never, you know, believe that aid is a good idea. She was trying to reach out to the middle ground. Now, in one respect, I think... She was probably mistaken in thinking about the public as likely to be persuaded by this kind of short-term security, short-term national interest narrative. Because all the research shows that actually the public believes in aid work when it's, it's based on a moral case and it's about helping poor people, it's about health and education. They struggle with stuff to do with jihadis, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. even though there's a complex argument to, to be had there. But what she's really, I think, also reaching out to is other government departments uh, and making sure that development is still central and that all the kind of prevent-type work doesn't take place in total isolation. So 
I think that's one comment that I would make. Great. Um, well, just to pick up on a couple more points, and I want to respond to Simon's question about different, as it were, frameworks that we're, we're bringing to this. I think, to me, the, the, actually the two words that Harriet used, context and power analysis, are also the critical ones. And my sort of story about trust and mistrust is essentially a story about context and power, and it's about understanding how mistrust can arise from a long-term context of change, development in that bigger sense, not of doing good and progressive change, but of long-term change in capitalist economic relations, can lead to situations where you do have a really fundamental falling apart of, of trust and relationships, and therefore a less, and, and those are the situations in which crises can unfold and become very hard to, to deal with. And so I think um, this point about context is really important. Going back to the first question that was raised, um, the, the point was made that humanitarian workers often rotate. Yeah. And I think one of the real problems with that is that, that, that those workers and agencies don't become knowledgeable about mm -hmm. the context they're working in because they're moving on. One disaster is, a, is, is another disaster. You're in Bangladesh one minute and you're in Lebanon the next. And, and so you know how to, to, to do your thing, your saving lives thing, but there's no ability or possibility really to get embedded and no time or incentive to get to know the people who could explain to you their history, their social institutions, what's gone before, the politics of a, of a setting, or indeed to build the kinds of long-term partnerships with, with the local institutions that know about those things. So um, I think this, this short-termist culture and, and lack of ability to do contextual analysis and the power analysis that is part of that context, um, is, it, they, those two things go together. And I think in overcoming those divides, I mean, I would absolutely agree with, with James that we need to look to ourselves. So how have I been looking to myself as a... a development studies academic and indeed to IDS as an institution that's been doing development and dabbling in humanitarian matters. I think we need to think about doing some new bridge building. One is to say that actually development and humanitarian studies are no longer separate things. We need to bring them together and we need to be doing what development studies actually does very, very well around contextual and power analysis. Um, and, and bring it to bear on this kind of nexus, only I don't really think we should be calling it a nexus. We should, because that, in a sense, perpetuates the idea that there are two things that need to come together. We, we actually need to break down that, that barrier. I also think there are real roles for breaking down a barrier between the academic and the practitioner. Um, so there's a lot of action going on out there in the world. And people who do development studies or who do long-term anthropology or political science and study countries and contexts in all their diversity and study situations of, of conflict and of global health and of, um, of, of famine and their causes actually need to communicate much better with the agencies that are trying to act on the ground. And that's, that's a little bit the, the story of this extraordinary experience I had with this Ebola response anthropology platform, which was an idea that came out of the fact that, that I and colleagues had spent 30 years or so doing really long-term work on social and cultural practices and issues in these three countries, and suddenly a big epidemic hit. And, and it was very obvious that there was missing knowledge about some of those long-term issues that maybe could be a bit useful in, in informing what was happening in this response. So we set up a, a platform, a kind of online set of resources and a set of dialogues which tried to bring that long-term knowledge into the hands of responders. And a lot of agencies were really interested in it and it spun out into a piece of work we're doing for UNICEF, which is called Social Science in Humanitarian Action and is now working across conflicts and natural disasters and complex emergencies as well as those involving health to try and do some of the same kind of thing to bring contextual analysis, power analysis to bear into the hands of the people who are doing the practice and action on the ground to help them become perhaps more rapidly attuned to the things that 
if they knew more about, they might be able to work differently. Um, and at the same time, in doing that kind of work, it certainly brought home to me the need to understand much better what the cultures, the practices, the needs are of people who are doing humanitarian work um, and to begin to understand better those cultures in order to, to work with them more effectively. So anyway, let's now, we've got time certainly for another round, if not two, of questions and comments and thoughts. So building on what's been said, let's carry on with the conversation. So we'll, there's one at the back, the lady at the back, then um, the gentleman from the Lebanon, I can say from the Lebanon, and then maybe we'll come to John. So you can do the microphone. Microphone walkabout. Hi, uh, thank you for that very interesting talk. I guess I have a few comments um, which might end up in a question, I'm not sure at this point. But, um, so one of the things that, you've, some, that uh, two or three of you actually, all of you have mentioned is about the, the development of knowledge um, and linking that to the time that people spend in a particular space. So I worked in development and in humanitarian aid for a long time. And in my experience, humanitarian workers more and more, they stay longer in location. So it's not really the case, I would challenge you there, that you know, they move around really quickly. Sometimes, yes, but definitely, and particularly in you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Jordan, yeah. these uh, Somalia, long protracted conflicts, that's less and less the case. Yeah. And conversely, um, development workers do move quickly sometimes, yeah. right? So I'm not sure that that categorization can be kind of like neatly made um, and then tied to like time and a space and then tied to you know, knowledge development and context. And I don't think that it really speaks to the ability of either or the lack of ability to understand the context if we you know, look at what's going on on the ground. And secondly, um, while I agree that you know, it's important to do conflict analysis and to be aware of the power relationships on the ground and the drivers of conflict and the local context itself, um, what I find missing from the conversation and maybe the presentations today is a really honest reflection about the politicization and the power dynamics of the organizations themselves, right? So of aid and humanitarian organizations. Um, because it's not just about like, you know, knowing what the interventions or the resources you bring will do or using participatory methodologies. Like that's not enough at all, right? It's really being honest about the fact that you represent something in that space, right? So that many uh, developments and humanitarian organizations are funded by countries who are involved in war in these places, right? In, in actual killing themselves. Um, and what that means for how you are perceived and not shying away from the fact that you are implicated in those spaces and in those conflicts um, just by virtue of being there, right? And so moving away from this idea that aid is really moralistic, you know, and we're all there to do good, and humanitarian work is about saving lives, and you know, really being honest about what's going on. And I think that that is really absent from this conversation, right? So it's not about, I would say, cooperation or better cooperation or more knowledge or sharing. There are much more fundamental questions that need to be addressed before we start thinking about linking anything to anything else. Okay. Great. So, I don't know if you Um, thank you, thank you very much. That was very interesting. But my question is kind of um, a bit more theoretical, but I, I think it's essential in order to solve this. Um, development studies and humanitarian work have quite different genealogies and quite different histories. Um, and I didn't see that that was being tended to. Um, last summer, I, I'm a sociologist, um, I'm trying to become a sociologist. Um, but if you're in Lebanon, if you're a social scientist, you kind of end up working with something which has to do with the humanitarian world or the development world sooner or later. Uh, and last summer, I worked as a research coordinator for a project on Syrian refugees. And one of the most stunning findings that we had was that a number of humanitarian aid agencies um, were smuggling religious artifacts with like the kids, they, the toys they were sending to kids. Um, and some agencies were, were telling uh, people in Lebanon, like state officials, well, we want to take 100 migrants to this ex-European country, uh, but they have to convert. Uh, if they convert, we'll take them. If they don't, we won't. Um, so obviously there's this element of, mis this missionary element, uh, which you find in humanitarian work, sometimes, obviously, not all the times, obviously, not all, not all agencies, uh, but it's there. Um, 
And I don't know if that, I don't think that's there in development studies because of these different genealogies. So how do you deal with that if you're talking about bringing them together? Uh, your, all of your thoughts on that. Thank you. Wow, great point. That's a, that's a really interesting example. Should we go to John, I think, just there? Yes, thanks very much. Re really interesting. I'm John Giventa, a fellow here at IDS. And I think this question picks up on both of the previous questions a little bit. If we're trying to ask the question, if we're trying to get an answer to your question of why do these fields stay apart when so obviously they should be interlinked, then I think we need to say what's, who's benefiting by them staying apart? And partly you're answering that on a cultural level, Tamsin, and I agree because I've been in those organizations and seen it. Partly we're answering it at an institutional level. Institutions benefit in a way by preserving their patch. But if we're really doing a power analysis, don't we also have to ask larger questions about geopolitical forces mm -hmm. and who the elites are who are benefiting by not joining these institutions up, these issues up? Now, I'm, I'm struggling to come with a good example, but Harriet, I bet you can come up with, with some. But there are people benefiting from conflict based on the lack of development inequality, and it's not in their interest to join it up. And there are people benefiting from inequality um, that's leading to conflicts, and they don't have any particular interest in lessening that inequality. And in fact, many arms manufacturers and others are, are making millions from it. So what are the larger political forces that are, um, no matter how hard we work to change our culture and our organizations, we're still going to have to deal with those larger forces? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Let's take a couple more. Um, because then I think we'll have to come back to panel. So let's take a couple more. So any that have, especially if you're continuing this thread around self-reflection on the bigger the bigger politics of all of this, the other points as well, yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping my question kind of follows with yeah, that. I'm great. curious to sort of the funding, sort of who's in control of the projects, the humanitarian or development, either or, the, the projects that are going <coughs> to these places, either in conflict or whatever. And, with the funding for the whatever NGOs or charities and the companies giving that, if there are big companies or usually companies, individuals, do you think that impacts on what is done in terms of what aid is done and if there's development and what sort of development? Okay. Great point. Robin? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Robin Luckham from IDS. Um, really a very, very short point, which is that if you're talking about power, to power analysis, you also need to think about how to build alternatives <coughs> to existing structures and, mm -hmm. and how to mm -hmm. move in that sort of direction. I'd just like your, your, your thoughts about this, because I think this is yeah. something which is done much too infrequently. Um, and uh, it's all very well to say that you, know, you speak truth to power and so on, but I think we actually have to build credible alternatives, credible ways of opposing uh, and resisting uh, those forms of power that we've been talking about. Okay, well, I think that's, unless there's one more, is this it's sort of following on the same theme-ish? Not quite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you allow me, Melissa, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dolph Talinslow. I'm here at IDS. I wanted to make an observation in terms of the terrain where the humanitarian yeah. development nexus is playing out increasingly and where both groups, if you wish, need to look for new solutions dealing with these crises. And this is the terrain of cities, the terrain of the urban. Yeah. And in my work, um, engaging with the global lines and urban crises, for instance, this, this is one of the themes that I notice that everybody is struggling with. Why is the urban different? How can we understand the complexity of the urban? And this relates very much in terms of the actors involved, particularly in, in crisis uh, and conflict-related sort of settings. I'm just thinking of, of Lebanon, sort of where you, in a city like Beirut, you have three, at least three different sort of planning models. Uh, one is run sort of very effectively by uh, state-affiliated private businesses and you know, top providing world-class world -class planning. At the same time, in the same cities are areas which are officially neglected, where Palestinian refugees are living and have, which have been neglected for, for decades. There's nothing going on there. And then at the same time, elsewhere in the city, there's an area controlled or uh, a, a non-state or partial, partial state sort of faith-based organization uh, 
uh, which has very effectively sort of rebuilt sort of large swathes of the city after it was bombed sort of by a foreign power. Um, so complexity of actors uh, and diversity that needs to be taken much more into perspective in these responses. And I think not many sort of, certainly not many of the um, humanitarian um, um, actors currently appreciate this diversity and complexity and they struggle to come to terms with, but so do the development folks. Okay. Great. Well, I'll now turn back to the panel. I'll go to Harriet first again. Um, well, uh, to start with the first question, the people who don't leave, of course, are the community groups and the people and ordinary citizens who live in that country, which is why I think all interventions have to be about enabling and supporting and building the strength of uh, local governments, but also local citizens groups to organise. And I think somewhere in there is part of the alternative that Robin's looking for, that I think we've absolutely got to move to a more political approach where we can really empower citizens' movements to take forward the changes they need to see uh, in their own countries, uh, which may often be exactly about a distribution of land and wealth. And I guess that same uh, solution, I think, applies then to the global stage. I completely agree with the politicisation and the power dynamics of aid, and it's absolutely clear that in the end, development aid is absolutely not the solution and is often part of the problem that we have absolutely got to look at how do we tackle the global structures of trade, for example, which are often uh, deeply unfair, and in a way, we as a nation benefit from them and then in our largesse give aid, which then doesn't work very well. And I should say this has been very well outlined by Robin's uh, soon-to-be-published paper, I think, about the, the unequal distribution of resources at a global level and then set us up, at which point we then talk about our values of fairness <laughs> and how we're going to redress the problems without tackling our own role in it. In particular, there was a recent uh, security capability review, uh, which didn't mention, uh, it, it talked about the problem that the rule of law globally is being eroded, which is indeed a real problem, but it didn't talk about, well, what about our own arms sales from Britain? What about the fact we're selling arms to the Saudis who are using them in Yemen? As Simon mentioned, we have to, uh, also confront those uh, geopolitical uh, power blocks. Um, and within that is the absolute imbalance of our resources. Globally, the world spends 250 times more on the military than it spends on peace building. It's an absolute joke, except it's not very funny. Uh, and then we're surprised that the world is getting more and more violent. Unless we tackle that allocation of our resources and put many, many of or more of our resources into exploring those alternatives, into supporting what people are doing locally, and particularly what women's groups are doing to create change at a local level, we're just going to go on being trapped in these ever more intractable conflicts, which then have got all the global superpowers messing in them. So I think that's one of the funding shifts that absolutely needs to take place, as well as having much more funding. Uh, it needs to be much more long-term. Mm. As you said, any change, any social change, we all know it takes decades. Uh, and therefore, if you're going to support long-term change, it also does need that uh, commitment from the donors and the commitment to support, in particular, local groups and women and young people, because as well as urbanisation, the other big trend is the changing demographics. Uh, and it's young people who are often kicking the hardest against the inequalities at a national and global level. Therefore, making sure that we're also bringing them in and addressing that has to be part of the transformation. Yeah. Brilliant. Townsend. Well, I see we've only got about one word. minute left. Yeah, exactly. Um, so luckily, that, that saves me from having to give the, you know, the, the depiction, the subtle depiction of all the political issues globally that, uh, that we could be discussing. I'll just, say very, I'll just concentrate very briefly on civil society organisations and mm -hmm. politics. Uh, in, in some ways, we are very comfortable with challenging the geopolitics. So when it comes to uh, even a quite intimidated sector, I have seen on several occasions direct challenge to the government about what's been happening in Yemen, uh, 
and great unhappiness about what's happened recently with the Saudi mm -hmm. partnership in that context. So this undermining in a one UK by another. Uh, that's, that's kind of okay. Next level, which is more challenging, is the being caught in the politics of complex emergencies and the compromises that have to happen there. That is quite difficult to talk about. Uh, and most challenging of all, probably, the north-south dynamics, which are so key to the localization agenda, and the complications of local cultures when it comes to issues like sexual exploitation and, and abuse. I'm just going to pick up two points really, really briefly. One, the funding question. Whoever asked that, I've lost you. That is spot on, and I think that we really need to think more about because it's another thing where we can use incentives to change yeah. cultures. And, and what many bond members would argue is that at the moment the funding is incentivizing the divide, and that's probably linked to the fact that humanitarian emergencies get a huge amount of publicity, uh, and there are all sorts of benefits and, uh, and other things that flow with that. And the last point which relates to that is on these alternative structures I think they will only emerge with funding which supports them. Great. Well, I'm going to have my one last minute to respond to a couple of these points and then finish off. I absolutely agree with what's been said about the need for, for us all to be reflective about our roles in these power dynamics, whether it's our roles as individuals, as members of institutions, or as citizens of countries who are setting themselves up to give humanitarian aid to be donors and yet are often very complicit in the vulnerabilities that cause those crises in the first place. And, and I think honesty and explicit debate which recognizes um, those, those roles is really important. And that's part of beginning to both, both recognize and then potentially start to unpick these power dynamics, which I think as colleagues have said and as all of you have said, extend from the power dynamics of why communities, and to get back to our gender theme, very often women and particular groups within them are so marginalized in these efforts and why alternatives need to build on them, but also extend up to the big politics, the geopolitics between countries and power blocks and regions in the world, which often get very, very entangled. Thinking about alternatives, I would heartily recommend to everybody a paper that Robin Luckham has just published, actually, in the Journal of Peacebuilding, um, which is about an idea he, he developed for some of our IDS work a couple of years ago about where the debate about building inclusive and secure societies had got to, and, and it forwards a notion of inclusive security which essentially starts to provide alternatives which, which build on where people are at um, and, and are more bottom-up and community-engaged in their approaches to thinking about the securities that matter in people's lives. I think the further work to do probably is to take that idea and connect it up with, as it were, the big geopolitics that we've all been talking about. And to do that, I think we need power analysis of, of two kinds, actually. And we've been talking a lot this evening about those very material political economies of funding flows, of interests in, in trade, in the arms trade, and so on. And as it were, the political economy of institutions and holding on to the spaces that they occupy, which are uh, to do with resources and materiality. But there's also another set of power relations which are about discourse and they're about messaging and they're about knowledge. And this is not about more knowledge solving the problem and filling gaps. It's actually about taking seriously power knowledge dynamics and trying to address the genealogies which have caused humanitarian and development work to be thought of separately and to try and shift some of the discourses which are leading these things to be thought of as a part and trying to bring into those discourses better acknowledgement of that power analysis. And a final point, a lot of this today, um, if one wants to posit one more proposition about why we're facing greater challenges and divides at the moment than perhaps in 1994 and earlier when, when, when this debate started to happen, I think we will also to be looking to the new discourses and communication media that are emerging through our mainstream media and through social media, which are sources for bringing people together, but are also 
part of what sometimes drives groups apart and which ramps up and sometimes hypes the messages about both development and aid and, and conflict and crisis in ways that which can, which can contribute to the problem as well as solving it. So that's a subject for another day. Um, I just want to finish by thanking enormously Harriet and Tamsin for some fantastic and I think very honest and very well-informed reflections. They've been as brilliant as I thought they'd be. Thank you to all of you for raising really good points, examples, stories, provocations from the audience. I don't think we've solved this problem. I don't think we've fully answered the exam question, but we've perhaps charted some ways forward in which we all need to work together in our different communities to reflect further on ourselves and to address it into the future. So a big clap to everyone and thank you. <laughs>